So good to be with you guys tonight. You might have caught, but I caught the lovely sunshine. I'm a little bit ruddy in the face, but it's also from dealing with pyromaniac 10 to 13 year old lads from St. Peter's on a, on a camping night away last night. And um, to be honest, feeding my inner pyromaniac too, because we, we lit these big bonfires and got them going. And I did that whole thing. I'm just taking my flint, I'm taking sparks, and that's all I'm taking. Little did I know how long it takes to light a fire that way, what we found out last night. Good fun. Good fun. And this morning, too, we got into it. So, uh, forgive me, I'm feeling a bit slightly tender on my feet after a bit of a night of no sleep. We're looking at God and suffering tonight. And, and it, thinking about this today, it reminded me of a time in my, my lectures at London School of Theology with the legend that is Graham McFarlane. I'll say that to you for all those LSTers out there past and present, but he lectured in Christology, and he changed my mind on something. He said, I've grown up thinking negative thoughts about the Catholic faith and their approach to icons and saints and the worship of saints, but he said something, you know what, sometimes we've made Jesus so ridiculously clean and, and pure. You know, you see him in the films and his blonde hair and his blue eyes. You see him in stained glass windows, his blonde hair and blue eyes. We made him so godlike that but people began to think they couldn't really connect with him, even though he's supposed to be our great high priest, our great connection with God. People thought, I can't connect with him, but I can connect with Peter because he messed up. I can connect with Mary, the mother of God. I can connect with all these humans. And so I can connect to God through them, but, but Jesus is just too pristine, too clean. He's not human enough in the way we treated him throughout history. And I thought, you know what? That's so true. It's true of my relationship with God. And you often have this picture of God as, as often said, you know, as like a as use like figure, mighty and powerful with a white beard who's moving pieces around on a chessboard, but rarely gets his own hands dirty. But that's not our God, is it? And as we come to this topic of suffering tonight, that's the first place we go to. It's Passion Sunday. We're leading into Easter. We're doing communion. And so I reflect on the cup, reflect on the bread in front of us, the shed blood a broken body because we have a God who refused not to get his hands dirty, who stepped down into the filth and the disgrace and the damage that humans do to each other and to our planet and made amends through his own body and through his own suffering. And that helps me. It's one of the reasons we're going to be looking at and the response to suffering is how much do we trust our God? in all the things that we don't understand, the things we don't get, the questions about how somewhere in the world now an innocent is horribly suffering, and we say, God, why don't you step in? We don't often have an answer to that, but we have a God who stepped in and said, I will put an end to this. Do you trust me? And that's a question we have to answer for ourselves. Has God done enough for you to be able to trust him when it comes to the big questions of life? So we start by reading Isaiah chapter 53. The God who steps in, the God who suffers. Isaiah chapter 53. Just a reminder as we we come to this. Who has believed our message, verse 1? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I read that and I can't help but think of that scene in uh, Mel Gibson's The Passion of a Christ where Jesus bloodied and scarred and bleeding as he carries a cross, stumbles under the weight of it. And uh, Mel Gibson 
takes a line out of Revelation and puts it on his lips as, as Jesus looks up and catches the face of his mother looking at him. And he says to his mother, see, mother, I make all things new. By his suffering, we are healed. By his suffering, the world is healed. And we have a new heaven and a new earth renewed in its fullest peace. God will bring an end to suffering. That's an important thing to remember. So that's the first thing. The God who suffers. That's the response to suffering. The God who steps in with us and earns our trust and says, I hear you. I feel this pain. I will not distance myself from it. Secondly, you might have, uh, you've probably come across this as one of the most one of the strong arguments that C.S. Lewis put forward and so many others through the ages have put forward about um, suffering. So imagine this, this, this very little scenario. Just go with me on a little tangent here. Imagine um, you fall deeply in love with someone, but that love is not returned to you. And lo and behold, a, a friend says, you know what, I've, uh, I've got someone who's uh, a, little bit of a, a little bit of a wizard, and if you go and see them, They've got something that can help you. You go and see this wizard, and they've got this little bottle. On, on it is marked love potion. And they say, if you give a drop of this to someone, they will love you for one night. But if you give them a teaspoonful of it, they will love you forever. Turn to the person next to you. Would you use that potion? All right. All right, we haven't got a lot of time. So I'll take, it, I'll take a straw pot. No, I should do this blindfolded. It? it says, close your eyes so no one can really see your response. All right. Who would, you, who would not use the love potion at all? Put your hand on the air. Who would not use the love potion? That is the majority of us. That's pretty much everybody because the vicar's looking around. Um, who, who would use a drop of it? Just for one night. Just for one night, Kim. <laughs> You're honest, Kim. I like it. Who would use a whole bottle? Who would use a whole bowl? Who might use a teaspoon? Anybody? Hmm. Okay, if you did use it, would it be love? It wouldn't be love, would it? It wouldn't be love. Okay. This is a free will defense, if you like, in, in terms of looking at suffering. Without free will, there can be no love. But with a potential to love, and this is a big point, with a potential to love comes a potential to hate. If God gives us a free will and we say, there is a certain degree of free will. We don't have absolute free will over our life circumstances, our choices, who we are, personality, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we do have free will to a degree, and we can exercise that free will when it comes to loving someone. So if God gives us that great gift of love, that great gift of free will, and we can say, actually, without free will, can you truly love? No. So God, in creating us to relate to him and to relate to each other, places out within us. But with it comes the flip side, the ability to refuse love, the ability to damage, and the ability to hate. That is a consequence of being given this powerful gift of being able to love with our free will. And we do use it, don't we? We're often the cause of most suffering in the world when it comes down to it. And when, you know, it's, it's, it's become a little bit of a cliche, but uh, if, when we ask, God, why is there so much suffering in the world? Or why don't you do something about the suffering in the world? God can always flip that question back on us, can't he, and say, why don't you do something about the suffering in the world? We spend more on ice cream every year than, the, than is totaled in the global debt. So if we just stop buying ice cream for a year, we could wipe out the global debt. Horrible stuff like that. We recognize that. You know, it sends a shiver down the spine, doesn't it? When you think about such stuff but we could actually do a lot more about the suffering in the world than we currently choose to do. Jean-Paul Sartre, the famous French philosopher, said, hell is other people. And imagine, even if God gives us all perfect bodies, like, like mine, but, but never, stop laughing, never get ill, never die, never feel pain, we could still cause each other psychological and emotional suffering and violate each other's wills. Even if God said, okay, I'm going to give you the, I don't know, you come into this world already made as a, as a I don't know, what's the perfect age? Is the perfect age my age? Probably is. 30, 35? 20, 30? 25? Let's go with 25, all right. Say, hey, it's 25 year old. And you get that body, okay. And then you never die, you never age, you never suffer at all. We can still cause each other 
psychological pain. They can still cause each other emotional pain. It doesn't solve that issue around free will and suffering. We can still use that to alienate people. Okay, so that's one, one way. And C.S. Lewis is, says this, the genius that he is. C.S. Lewis, the writer and English professor at Oxford and Cambridge. God created things which had free will. That means creatures which can go wrong or right. If a thing is free to be good, it's also free to be bad. And free will is what has made evil possible. Why then did God give them free will? Because free will, though it makes evil possible, is also the only thing that makes possible any love or goodness or joy worth having. A world of automata, I can't pronounce that very well, robots essentially, of creatures that work like machines would hardly be worth creating. If God didn't give us free will in the first place, that potential to relate to each other or to choose not to relate, then God might as well have created a race of slaves without free will. God might as well have created a race of robots. He wouldn't have even bothered in the first place. Moving on, thinking about, going back to what I started off with, trusting in God's absolute wisdom. Has God done enough for you to trust him even though you don't know all the answers? So you might have had to look after a small child, a toddler, just finding their legs and finding their speed. Imagine you're in a, you're in a garden and uh, you're playing away, that's, that's nice. I mean, you're running about, you're running about, and you don't realize that the garden gate is open. And beyond the garden gate, the open garden gate is an extremely busy road. And the toddler spies freedom through that gate and runs for it. You peg it ahead of them, slam the gate shut, and pick them up in their arms. That toddler does not understand why you've just done what you've done. They saw freedom, but you saw the danger. You saw the pain, because you can peer over the garden fence, and you pick them up in your arms, and they're crying, and they're crying. Eventually, they settle, and they don't get it. They don't understand. We're always going to be infants in the eyes of our God. and We have an infantile understanding of life the universe and everything. We can think we're pretty smart, but when it comes down to it, we know zip compared to what he knows about life, the universe, everything. Do you trust him enough to put your life in his hands? Even when you see things and say, I don't understand why they're suffering right now. I don't understand why my family is suffering right now. I don't understand why people who seem innocent right away around the world are suffering right now. God, I don't get it trust you. I trust you in this, that your will is good and you will work all things out for good. And that's difficult. As Tim Keller argues, there was a time when people just took it as read. In the past, it was assumed that if God was infinite and deeply mysterious, then his ways would have to be beyond our comprehension. He got the whole thing going, of course. This is kind of just in the growth of a science age before that. Saying, yes, of course. God is, is vaster than us. Unbelievable. The more we uncover about the scope of life and the scope of the universe, it just makes us realize how immense he is. Of course, there's a, there's a whole area of understanding that is shut off to us because we just don't have the brains to understand it. But in our, the growing age of reason, as the science developed, particularly in Europe, we became more and more skeptical in answering the big questions of life. And we kind of said, actually, everything's about reason. Reason is God. Reason is king. And so we bring God down to our level and say, if God wants to be accountable, then he must be accountable to our human reason and our understanding about things. And that's the age we're in. It's deeply cynical when we sort of say, actually, you know what? I trust God. That's not good enough. God has to answer to our reason and to our understanding. As we got larger in our own eyes, says Tim Keller, and more sure that we understood how the universe worked, how history should go, the problem of evil became so intolerable. So we need to recapture that bigger view of God as hard as it is and be more realistic about our own limitations. We've got to understand we do have limits. We are infants in our Father's arms. Do you trust him? That's a big question. I've just got to keep coming back to the cross and saying God's love for me is a thousand a million times, yes, in Jesus. And I look at that, and I say, yes, I trust you, even though I don't always get it. Paul, get your, uh, get your eternity goggles on, is uh, this point. This is a bizarre one. But um, 
a materialist age, an age where everything is right here, right now, I've got to have it, and I'm about satisfaction in the present. I'm not going to wait for satisfaction. If I want something, I'm just going to buy it. You know, I get, I get yeah. If, you know, we, we all get itchy brains, don't we? And itchy hearts when it comes to wanting stuff. And it's all about the now. In that age which has this kind of really, really, really short horizon and focus, and we're all suffering from attention deficit, it's hard to think about the big scope and the big picture that the Bible gives us. And again, I hinted at that right at the beginning. So when Revelation speaks of a time when there'll be no more tears, it means that in the age to come, the renewed heaven and the earth, it will be as if there had been no such thing as suffering. That's hard for us to imagine right now. We're in the midst of a world that is full of suffering. It's hard to see that. But then we've all had dark days when hope seems extinguished. And we think, how can I ever live in hope in the light of life again? But surely those dark days have passed. And we think, yes, yeah, a light has come into my heart again. And equally, we have those, those times of extreme joy. And look and think, ah, oh, great. Those dark days are never going to dog me again. They might come back. They might come back. But there are times when we're so full of light and hope that it seems that it extinguishes the darkness that we experience. And God says, that is my promise, because I am the source of all light and hope and love and life. And I say to you, there will be no more tears in the age to come. It's hard for us to understand that. But do you trust him? This might sound a little bit shallow, but it's like, um, whoever went and hunted down the, uh, the doctor that caused them so much pain when they were a baby for jabbing a needle into them to give them an inoculation. You don't remember that pain, do you? You don't remember it. A little bit of suffering when you had a needle jab and you cried out in agony. You screamed out. And it was all part of what the doctor needed to do to make you healthy. Can we imagine a day when actually we look back and it's as if we've never suffered at all? Do we believe and trust in God for that. See, Mother, I make all things new. Finally, um, and this is a point, so it's just a little side one, really. It links back into the idea of free will. But um, I know I've, I've sinned. I know I've caused myself damage. I know I've called, caused others damage in the way that I've chosen to live my life. I don't know if the way that I live my life now isn't particularly great for the planet, if I'm really brutally honest about it. And so if we're asking God to intervene in evil, where does he begin? Does he begin with a thought in our brain? Does he begin with a, the little action, that little bit of shoplifting I did when I was 15 years old? Does he stop me doing that? Does he police me with his angels? Does he restrict my hand from taking that packet of bags? What does he do? How does he intervene? Is it all the time? Does God have to become extremely tyrannical in his rule over us in order to intervene? And on whose behalf does he intervene? You think of, I don't know, you think of World War II. We always point the finger at Germany and the Axis powers and say how evil they were. But you look at figures like Allied bombings, German bombings of of Britain, they killed around 120,000 people. Allied bombings of, of mainland Europe killed around 300,000 people because we deliberately targeted civilian areas in order to demoralize the troops at the front. They see what's what happened to our families back there. It's tricky, isn't it? Wars like Vietnam, wars like the Gulf War, who was right and who was wrong? How does God intervene in those things? It comes back to that question that started off with free will. But the biggest question, and the one that I'm going to leave you with, as we go into communion, and what a powerful response to what we've heard about tonight is, do you trust him? Do you trust this great and beautiful God who laid his life on the line for all of us when it comes to the suffering that we experience? Let's pray.